Denver's Olympic dream could be dead a lot sooner than once expected. The games being pursued by a coalition of Colorado's wealthy and politically powerful aren't until the year 2030. But voters could decide to drop the whole idea 110 days from today. The Olympics are about time, whether the ages since the first games in Greece or the milliseconds separating sprinters. And while 2030 seems a long time from now, Denver's Olympic bid may expire sooner than you think. Let's tick back from the year 2030. The host city for those games would be selected in 2023. The U.S. Olympic Committee would pick its contender in 2021. The coalition here in Colorado pushing a Denver bid, they'd look to have their non-binding statewide vote in 2020. But it could be over before that. I don't think we need it in Colorado, and I think it'll make things worse, not better. Democrat Jared Polis says if he's elected governor this November, an Olympic bid will not happen on his watch. Republican Walker Stapleton was more open to the idea. Kyle, I would need a guarantee of no public financing. As a business guy, I need to make sure that it actually made money and penciled for us because there's no, no, no point in, in having the games, even though they'd be awesome, by saddling us with more debt. Opponents of the Denver games have another trick up their sleeve. They're aiming for a 2019 municipal ballot measure in Denver, right alongside the mayor's race. It would ask voters to prohibit the use of Denver tax dollars for the Olympics. That could be an unceremonious closing for a Denver bid, even if a Governor Polis doesn't extinguish the flame before then. This week, Colorado is getting a front row seat to the chaos that is American foreign policy lately. Key law enforcement and national security leaders are here in Colorado, where today they were caught by surprise by President Trump's announcement that Russian President Vladimir Putin has been invited to the White House. Director of National Intelligence Dan Coates was told this by a journalist live on stage in Aspen. That's going to be special, he said. FBI Director Christopher Wray was in Denver. He was preparing to meet with local reporters when he was caught flat-footed. Uh, you know, I just heard about the meeting as I was walking down that hallway here. Um, you know, I'm going to wait till I get more of the facts. Uh, you know, a 15 second heads up as I'm walking down the hallway. We don't know each other, but one of the things I try not to be is somebody who just pops off when I don't have all the facts. So, Sounds like a tough place to work. Those administration leaders were all in Colorado for this week's Aspen Security Forum. So remember that Elbert County race that was decided by one vote? Well, after a recount, the county clerk found a missing vote. It belonged to the guy in the lead. So, hey, he doubles his margin of victory, right? It got our Marshall Zellinger wonder how these extra votes just appear. Anthony Hartsook versus Rick Pettit for Elbert County Commissioner. Hartsook entered this week down 2,993 votes to 2,994. One vote. Until the Elbert County elections team spent time in this basement scanning all the ballots again, recounting. After the recount, uh, Mr. Pettit picked up one vote in the recount, so the final tally was 2,995 to 2993. How do you have a recount and end up with more votes than you had in the original count? That's a great question. That's what I've been asking, answering all day long. And the reason is because our process changes just a little bit. As we told you last week, 485 Republican ballots that were turned in that did not have a, a mark for either commissioner candidate in the race. Those 485 were looked at more closely. The scan only picks up if the uh, circle is 5% filled in or more. And one was discovered to have enough of a mark that gave Pettit one more vote. If it's an obvious intent and it follows a pattern of the rest of the ballot, that that's the candidate they were voting for, then that's how the, the judges will adjudicate. There was no drama. He just called to give me the, the straight statistics. Hartsook was hoping one vote would have swapped from his opponent to him. Instead, Hartsook's deficit doubled. The system works. The system did what it's supposed to do. The judges did their jobs. The representative secretary of state did his job, and at this point, we need to move forward. Last week, Hartsook said one of his friends who is unaffiliated didn't know they could vote in the primary. On the bright side, that friend and, uh, is now off the hook. He did follow up with me. He goes, hey, I'm glad I'm still your friend. I'm like, I said, you were not the only one. I'm sure he's feeling a little bit uh, more at ease at this point. <laughs> 
So does a new vote total trigger another automatic recount? Great question. I'm glad I asked. The board made up of a Democrat, Republican, and that county clerk all agreed that this vote total will stand. The results were actually certified last night. Even Hartsook accepted it, Kyle. I got to ask you, he's talking about if it matches the intent of the voter on the rest of the ballot, what does that mean? So that means they're staring at the ballot, and if they see a little tick mark in that spot, they look at the other uh, races that were voted, and if it's there's tick marks in those that the computer uh. picked up on them like oh they intended to vote for that person. it's not which party it's kind of like your handwriting I got mm -hmm. it now all right Marshall thank you so a couple years back Colorado's Republican Secretary of State Scott Gessler went hunting for voter fraud he didn't really find any you will hear people frantically point to the places where there are more people on the voter rolls than there are eligible results I mean that's got to be fraud right it sounds shocking until you remember the fact that people die and people move away people like Charlotte whose family sent a handwritten letter to Denver elections informing them of Charlotte's passing. Please remove her name from your roles, it says. Charlotte's daughter went on to write, Charlotte was almost 101 and never missed voting in any election since she was old enough to exercise that privilege. Thank you, Charlotte. Born into a world where women were not guaranteed the right to vote, and she clearly never took that right for granted. A note won't remove somebody from Denver's voting roll, so don't bother doing that with your uncle that you disagree with politically. The state health department sends out a monthly list of people who are known to have died. Election workers will then look for an obituary or information from a family for confirmation. They try to err on the side of keeping people on the rolls unless they're sure that somebody's voting days are in fact done. Denver has plenty of panhandlers who know how to stand out to get your attention. The man in the red Make America Great Again hat got our Jeremy Hohola interested enough to stop by for a quick conversation. Of course, it was the Make America Great Again hat that caught my attention. To see it on a man panhandling is unusual. I stopped and spoke with Casey, who says he's an artist who's been living on Denver streets for the past week. We spoke for 10 minutes on a street corner just outside of Nine News. A jovial man with a quick handshake, Casey wouldn't say if he supported Trump or not. He would just say, I'm an American, when I would ask him about his hat. He has a dog named Jameson, who was cooling off in the shade of his shopping cart. After our conversation ended, I left Casey and wondered where he would stay the night, along with the thousands of other people in Denver who make the city pavement their bed. 71,000 Coloradans are currently having their memories stolen. A quarter of a million family members in Colorado care for people who have Alzheimer's and other forms of dementia. Often they do so without really knowing what's going on in that patient's mind. Our Steve Steger got a special opportunity today to see those symptoms through the help of a virtual tool. Do you mind giving me those instructions again or no? Nope. So they gave me gloves, they gave me goggles, and they gave me eyewear, and then you walk into this room. Yeah, I think the whole purpose is really for individuals who are either touched by Alzheimer's or they work in the field to get a sense of what it's like to live every day with the disease. So I kind of was in awe. And then next thing you know, the woman who walked me into the room read off a list of tasks for me to complete. I caught on to that about halfway through her reading this list. But I kind of walked in the room and had a sensory overload. Oh, here we Most go. people think dementia is just a little bit of memory problem. We know that when Alzheimer's affects your brain and starts killing brain cells in a very methodical pattern, a lot of other things start to change as well, like how you process your visual field, how you process what you hear, your ability to uh, filter out um, noises and sounds. One of the most poignant moments for me was the moment that I walked out and took the headphones off and took the oh goggles <laughs> off and there was this overwhelming feeling of silence in the room even though it wasn't a silent room. People who struggle with this don't get that moment of peace. As your thinking and reasoning and your memory starts to fade, the sensory almost becomes amplified. And it took me back to days before we knew something was wrong with my dad when I would call him on the phone and he's at work and so you imagine he has all these different things going on all around him and he wouldn't be able to focus on what we were talking about and I got angry. Why did I get angry at him? Like now I kind of have that in the back of my mind. And if I could give one piece of advice to caregivers it would be let's not forget that humanity. Let's not forget this is just a person 
trying to make it and you're just a person who loves them and is trying to help them through. So this experience is not for everyone. They often offer it at assisted living facilities to try to give families a better idea of what a patient is feeling. So if you're interested, the Alzheimer's Association can help you get connected to the services you need. We're going to put the number up on our website, Kyle. But that, that, that's mm -hmm. the thing I took away from this. And the thing that they say a lot of people take away is that it's not a memory thing. It's not 100% a memory thing. Yeah. It's everything in the room. And you you lose that ability to filter out just the conversation you're having. You yep. hear the fan in the mm -hmm. back of the room. You hear a conversation going on over here, and it's just all playing out for you right there. Noise and confusion. Yeah. People are going to wonder how your dad's doing. Those photos they saw of him watching you win that Emmy and you guys hoisting the beers, those are from last week. Yeah, he's doing great. That's awesome. Um, he's doing really well. But this gives me perspective. Yep. Spend the time yep. now and make those memories. Thanks, Steve. Yeah. Hey, can I make a recommendation? I, I would love for you to see a side of our friend and coworker, Kim Christensen, that you might not always see through the TV box. But you get a sense of it from her long-form interview that appears in Westward today. Kim, of course, is best known for her compassionate storytelling and the human touch that she always brings to the news. What we know behind the scenes is that Kim Christensen has an incredible work ethic. Born of the fact that she started here as an overnight writer, fresh out of college in 1985. Kim tells Westward how all those years working for the always demanding Ed Sardella guides her work and her passion today. And she's open about her trepidation about taking over the 10 p.m. news from Adele Arakawa. It is wonderful insight into a wonderful woman. There's a link to the article on the next Facebook page. Another prominent paper in Colorado pulls back from publishing seven days a week and remembering a young man from our state who lived to be in the arena. There was something that he loved to do. It was the last thing he ever did. We'll remember him next. The Grand Junction Daily Sentinel will no longer land with a satisfying slap on doorsteps each Monday and Tuesday. The Sentinel's joining the growing number of papers that won't bring paper versions on Mondays and Tuesdays to save costs. Starting next month, subscribers will get a digital edition by email. The Sentinel's publisher says they were facing a choice to keep that paper going. They had to raise subscription rates or cut the staff or reduce the number of days in print. He knew reaction would be mixed. We get a fair amount of uh, response that's been like, you know, we get it. You know, it's, I understand, you know, print advertising revenue has really declined and you've got to do whatever you've got to do to to serve mission and stay in existence. Um, on the other hand, I've gotten a fair number of telephone calls from our older readers who are really um, upset. You know, we've disrupted their um, their routines, and so they are not they're not happy to not get a printed newspaper on Mondays and Tuesdays. And they don't have a computer, have never you know turned on a computer and don't want to. So it, they feel like something's been taken from them. That's been rough. Jay Seaton, the publisher, has gone so far as to set up seminars at the library to teach those older readers how to navigate online, though he acknowledges a bunch of them have said it's not a physical paper. They're just not interested. While we are talking about what happens when newspapers thin and then vanish, the Colorado Sun's off to a bright start. That new online publication launched by people who left the Denver Post has more than doubled its Kickstarter goal. Full disclosure, I donated. They may be our competitor, but at this point, Denver Journalism, we need all the voices we can get. Another hot summer day with high temperatures close to 100 degrees this afternoon. We'll do that again tomorrow and Saturday, but a break is coming. Cooler weather and the chance for showers late in the weekend are high way above the average of 90, a trend that we'll see, as I mentioned, for another 48 hours. There were triple digit highs in eastern Colorado and out across the western slope. And with high pressure anchored where it is, the threat for severe weather is far east of us, but the storms are strong. Minneapolis, St. Louis, and right down to the Wichita area, we've had reports of funnel clouds, large hail, and damage. Wind. High pressure ridge will break down on Sunday. Between now and then, temperatures way above average and it will be tinder dry around the area. But on Sunday, we'll have a little more moisture to work with and temperatures back in the 80s. Fair skies, mild and dry downtown tonight with lows in the mid 60s. Hot highs in the mid 90s again tomorrow and Saturday. Isolated storms on Saturday and then a good chance of rain from slow moving storms Sunday, Monday and Tuesday. Some models suggest highs in the 70s next week. Sounds too good to be true, but it's possible right now. Monday Monday's high temperature right at 83 degrees and great travel in and out of the high country tonight.
Colorado Springs crowdsourcing a name for its baseball team could have gone a lot worse. Teamy McTeam face is not among the options, but there's one contender we really need to make happen. And it's time for another reminder, that's not how you Colorado. One of our viewers tries to separate man and moose. Look at that right there. Next. Jason Blaisdell might have made the news someday as a champion bull rider from our backyard. He was born and raised in Fruta. Jason did not live to see his ultimate dream realized, but he always lived in pursuit of the dream. He died earlier this month after a bull ride in Saratoga, Wyoming, and we remember him this evening through the words of his father. My son was very anything he set his mind to. That he was just a, one of them perfect sons to me. He helped everybody that needed help. He was very quiet, but very well disciplined through what he did. He leaves behind two little daughters, his wife Heather. We love the sport of rodeo. It was something that he loved to do. My community stepped up for a young man that lost his life, you know, entertaining. There's so many people with big hearts out there that I know in the end it will matter. Jason Blaisdell was 30 years old. He leaves a wife and two young daughters. It is time tonight for another reminder for folks. That's not how you call a rock. Look at that right there. Look at that. Boom. Moose. Human. Moose. Human. They're not supposed to be that close. The, the moose is the size of a minivan, man. It can move just as fast and it has antlers instead of a horn. Guy doesn't even, he doesn't have a shirt on. It's a bad decision day for him. Next viewer named Jessica was behind that video as well as the sharp-tongued warning that she issued out the window at Brainerd Lake yesterday. She says it is just infuriating to see people getting too close to wildlife, putting all of them at risk. Somebody down in Colorado Springs had the terrible idea to let us vote on the name of their baseball team. So now we have a chance to do something epic together. Our plan of attack is next. Springs letting people choose the name of its new minor league baseball team was just asking for trouble. We knew that. 2,000 suggestions have been whittled down to five finalists. Sadly, Teamy McTeamface did not make it. But there is only one of these five finalists that I badly want on a t-shirt. So I need you to do this for me, people. Colorado Springs Happy Campers, no, that's too cute. Same with Colorado Springs Lamb Chop. Colorado Springs Punchy Picas, do we really want to spend our whole time telling people about a little mountain critter that's not actually a Pokemon character? Colorado Springs Throttle Jockeys, that's a nice nod to the pilots, but come on. The Rocky Mountain Oysters? We need this, people. Could you imagine what the cartoon character could look like? You have until August 1st to vote for your favorite finalist. And by your favorite finalist, I mean my favorite finalist. Please do this for me. We finish with your feedback tonight. A number of you writing in to share wonderful memories and thoughts about our colleague Kim Christensen. She was profiled in Westward today. I encourage you to read it. Ann Byrne says, met her just waiting for friends a few years ago at a fundraiser. I was already a fan and became instantly super nervous. Kim was amazing. So very kind, really sweet, complimenting my jacket, treating me like we had known each other forever. That's exactly the way she is with us here at work, except she has never complimented my jacket's not even once. See you next time.